Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's District 14 Contest Team Training. We are calling today's training the importance of dodging contest gotchas. We are delighted that you are here. My name is Linda Rogers, and I am the District 14 Contest Chair. Other members of the committee are J.D. Dirk Schneider, Laura Olson, Joanne Sheets, Trina Mackey, and Debbie Thompson. We are recording today's training, so I do want to read the recording or read the recording statement just to make sure that you have it. By attending this training, this event, I consent and authorize District 14 to copyright, use, and publish any of the images in any format, photographs, videos, etc., taken of me. I understand these images may be used for a variety of purposes and may appear on the District 14 website, social media, promotional materials, or any other media. We ask for Zoom navigation that you keep your audio on silent unless you are speaking, that you keep, if possible, your video on just so we can see your faces. During the PowerPoint, which there will be a lot, you can use the side-by-side -side view to see participants and the PowerPoint simultaneously. And the chat is open so you can communicate with everyone or communicate privately with someone else. I do want to remind us about the speech contest deadlines this year. We've already been doing table topic speeches. The clubs identified their contestants in October. The areas had their contest in November. And four of the eight divisions have held their contest in December with the other four waiting until March. Table Topics does go to the district level, which will be on April the 14th at the annual conference. International speeches are coming up next. In January, the clubs need to identify their contestants. In February, the area contest will be held. In March, the division contest. And then on April the 15th at the district conference will be the international speech contest. I also want to remind everyone about the contest format. Clubs can choose whether they want to hold their contest in person, online, or hybrid. But area contests can only be in person, or sorry, area contests can only be online. Division contest only online and the district level competitions in April will be hybrid. Some people will be present and some people will be online. We ask that you put any questions you have in chat so they can be answered as we go, but also there will be a Q&A session at the end so you can ask your questions. First, we're going to start off with some polls. I will now turn this meeting over to Toastmaster Laura Olson. Laura. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, and thank you fellow Toastmasters for spending part of your Saturday with us. We just wanted to start out with some polls just to gauge everybody's comfort level with contests, et cetera. So our first poll is, how do you think your club area division table topics contest went this quarter? And all answers are correct, so don't be shy. Getting some answers. We have one of two, four or five. All right, we're going to end the poll and I will share the results with you. So we had one person that said they said that their speech contest went perfect. Congratulations. Two out of five that said it went really well. And then two of the out of five said you had a few glitches, but were able to adjust. That is excellent. That so we're glad it went well. All right, we are going to, and that is poll number one. Thank you for responding. All right, so poll number two, did you watch any of the contest training videos on our D14 training YouTube channel before holding your table topics contest this quarter? Thank you, I see some honest answers in here, appreciate it. Okay, we have, all right, it's a five of five people have shared. I'm going to share the results. We have two people that said they watched all of them and three people said they didn't watch any of them. They definitely are still out there for you to watch on the District 14 YouTube channel. We definitely encourage you to watch them. 
going forward, when preparing for the next contest, do you plan to watch any of the contest training videos on our District 14 training YouTube channel? And be honest. I have three of three, it looks like. Okay, we have all five people sharing the results. We had four of five people that said yes. They plan on watching them and one person has said, probably not. Again, we encourage you to watch them. We hope that you will find some great information from there. All right, and Linda, I believe that that concludes our poll for now. We will have another poll to end our session. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Joanne Sheets to talk about the elephant in the room. Joanne. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. The elephant in the room. Some clubs, areas, and divisions have held outstanding contests. However, let's not ignore the elephants or elephants in the room. The first elephant is not, we have not read the speech contest rule book. That's important. The second elephant is we might not have watched the contest training videos, which are available as our resources. The third elephant is treating contests like club meetings. A fourth elephant might be that we have not planned properly for the contest. And the last elephant may be that people don't know what they don't know. We want the elephants to exit the room. So use your responses, I mean, your resources, I'm sorry, the speech contest rule book and the contest training videos. Remember that we're holding official Toastmasters contests. Therefore, it's not our usual meeting. And finally, we don't know what we don't know, but using our resources and careful and meticulous planning, these elephants must leave the room. Additionally, in a Zoom hybrid environment, it is important to practice, practice, practice. We are leaders in Toastmasters and we set the bar high, become knowledgeable about contest rules and procedures, I have strong contests, not ones that just limp along. Then surely the elephants will exit the room. I turn the meeting over to Toastmaster Debbie Thompson. Debbie. Thank you, Joanne. So you may be asking yourself, why should clubs have contests? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of planning. Yes, but let's talk about why you should have contests. Next, when you have a contest, it can really attract interest in your club and create a little buzz. And this is what Toastmasters International tells us. Next, you have a contest, and I think this is one of the most important reasons to have a contest is so that your contestant, the person representing your club, can understand how the contest format runs. That's just one less thing for that contestant to have to worry about. If they see your club having a contest, then they'll know what to expect at the next levels. Next, you wanna gain skills for your members. So having contests can help them understand the skills that they need to become contest officials. And then they can help out whenever they have contest at the area division level. Next. You want to showcase your members, your speaking skills. So you might even consider having a contest as an open house, but publish it. Make sure people know about it. Next. And finally, <clears throat> we always want to make sure we get credit for doing something like this. So let your member get credit for having a Pathways project completed where they lead a team and have show leadership skills. Next. So let's talk about a few contest, club contest considerations. Next. The rule book says that a club in good standing, and that means you have eight members, paid members, that you can choose the club, and this is a quote, by whatever means the club desires. You can roll the dice, you can draw straws, you can voluntold someone, you can take volunteers, 
But if you do have a contest, you have to follow the rules. And I had one club ask me when I was the area director, we had a contest. Our one contestant was time disqualified. <clears throat> Can we just send someone else? And I told them, no, you've had an official contest. You have to abide by the rules and you would not be able to send someone if you had a time disqualification. So just remember, if you do have a contest, you have to follow the rules. Next. This is something that's very important. You need to understand how many contest officials you have to have. And we will be putting this worksheet into the chat so you can take it with you. But it outlines <clears throat> that you need a contest chair. That same person could be the chair and the contest master. That's the toastmaster of the event. You also need a, a chief judge. But then when you have the at the club level, Linda, it says you have five voting judges where practical. And so try to get as many judges as you can. This is very important because the more judges you have, the more you're able to uh, get out of those biases for, for, for judges if you only have a few people. I had a contest a while back that had two judges, period. If something had happened to one of them, you would have had one person deciding your contest. So try to get as many judges as you can. That's very important. Next, <clears throat> at a club level, you have two ballot counters. <clears throat> and then you have as many sergeant at arms in the contest as you need. If you're having table topics or evaluations, of course, you need somebody to be able to sequester your contestants. Next, <clears throat> excuse me. A contestant's eligibility at club level is you are a paid member, your club is in good standing, and you are your dues are paid and current with world headquarters. Next. One of the things we wanted to point out here today is because is because the international contest is coming up. And there is an additional requirement for the international contest. That is that you have certified completion in levels one and two of any path or you are a DTM. And so what that means is if you've earned a certificate, that means it's approved in pathways. It's not necessarily submitted through Club Central, but it is important as VPE that you plan. If you have members who want to compete and they have not finished their level one and two, you need to get them going on doing speeches. It is doable, but just remember that that is one of the requirements. And then charter members have special rules all their own. Next. The next slide, I just wanted to point out, if you have members who are in multiple clubs, a, a member can compete in as many clubs as they meet the eligibility requirements for. So you can, you can be in several club contests. However, once you get to the area level, a contestant has to decide which area they want to represent. Even if you are in different districts, you can only compete in one area. Next. So we do hope that your club has a contest for all the reasons we pointed out. And now we're going to get into contest gotchas. Linda. Thank you, Toastmaster Thompson. Today's training is the importance of dodging contest gotchas. We all have them. In spite of our best efforts, sometimes things go a little bit awry. There are some mishaps. And sometimes they are things that we can control and sometimes they are things that we cannot. But let's talk about some of those contest gotchas that can occur. What we have done for this training is to take a contest and divided it into seven parts so we can concentrate on each part and their appropriate gotchas. Our first part is before your contest actually takes place, the planning, the briefings, and the practice. One of the gotchas around planning is being an ostrich and sticking your head in the ground, ignoring what needs to be done, thinking that things will just come together organically, not understanding the contest rules and the procedures, 
not knowing which roles really need to be filled and how many of each role you need, not starting early enough to fill those contest roles, thinking that people are just going to volunteer. I don't know about you, but I've never had people line up at my door wanting to volunteer to fill a role at a speech contest such that I had to turn people away. I have announced it in general to everyone in an email or at a club announcement, but I've also had to spend a lot of time following up one-on-one -on -one with people to find volunteers. So start early to fill those positions and don't expect people to line up at your door. Another gotcha is asking people who do not have experience to fill major roles. I would not ask someone to be a chief judge unless they've been a judge before. I would not ask someone to be a contest master unless they have more experience in Toastmasters and have served as Toastmaster of a club meeting, for instance. So be careful who you ask to fill the roles. We want people to learn and you learn by doing, but at the same time, we need to be careful whom we ask. We do not want, for instance, to ask someone who does not have the proper technology to fill a technical role. Do not ask someone to be a chat master for your online contest when they're going to be using their phone. Do not ask someone to be a Zoom master if they don't actually have a laptop, if the best they can do is a tablet. Don't ask them to be a Zoom master. So be just careful. Another gotcha situation in planning is not having clear lines of communication. When you plan your contest, have clear responsibilities and clear communication lines so that things do not fall through the cracks. And finally, when you're planning, make sure you have enough people to have backups. People will drop out at the last minute, get sick, have a family emergency, whatever, and you need to have someone else you can call upon at the last minute. For planning resources, we have two to suggest, which Debbie Thompson will be dropping in chat. The first one on the left is a document that she put together to help you identify how many contestants you need, and you can fill in the names as you find them. The one on the right is an Excel spreadsheet that I've put together when running contests in the past, and it lists all the people that you need for a particular type of contest, and then you can replace those names with the actual individual names as you find individuals. This also has Zoom Master categories on it too, whereas the one on the left does not. Now let's go on to briefings. It's important that you brief everyone before your contest begins, as in several days beforehand, at least at a minimum. Some of the gotcha situations for briefings is you assume everybody knows already what to do or that they're capable of figuring it out on their own. You do not brief your judges, your ballot counters and timers. You don't brief your contestants, your sergeant at arms, and you don't even brief your Zoom masters. And the Zoom masters for an online event are really important. Who's going to handle the breakout rooms? Who's going to do the spotlighting? Who's going to admit people? Who's going to show the PowerPoint? For instance, right now, I'm acting as a Zoom master or one of them, and I'm showing the PowerPoint. But when you show PowerPoint, you can't do anything else because the PowerPoint takes up your whole screen and anything you do, everyone else can see too. Another got you in briefings is not having a specific person or persons responsible for communications. You want to have one person whom the contestants deal with one person whom the Zoom masters deal with, et cetera. You don't want to have so many people with their fingers in the pot, too many cooks, not enough, not enough eaters, so to speak, for whatever it is that you're making, but you just want to make sure that you've got clear lines of communication. And finally, make sure you know what the responsibilities are for each of those roles as defined in the contest rule book. So have briefings before your contest and not necessarily 45 minutes before the contest is to start. You need to have them several days ahead of time. And then finally, you need to practice. If you don't practice your contest event before your actual contest, it would be as if you were saying, let's have a concert. You work on your music at home. We'll meet five minutes before the concert starts, and we're going to hope that everyone knows their music. That does not work. 
you need to have a practice ahead of time. So gotcha situations during the practice is not requiring people to attend the practice, especially those with major roles. In my personal opinion, if your contest master cannot attend a practice, that person is not going to be the contest master because that's one of the glue parts that holds the contest together. And that person needs to be at the practice. Also, do not be too timid in correcting things during a practice. I have no problem saying, stop, back up, let's go over this part again and get it more smooth. Do not avoid practicing the small details. Are you going to play music while people are coming in from the waiting room so you can create the right ambiance? Then make sure you practice that during your practice. Do not gloss over major details either. During the practice, make sure that your Zoom master handling the breakout rooms practices putting people in and out of the breakout rooms. And finally, be sure to share all the pertinent files and information with your Zoom masters. Make sure they have the PowerPoint. Make sure they know who the people are to be put into the breakout rooms, etc. The more you practice, the better your event will be. But make sure you have a practice. I will now turn control over to Toastmaster Laura Olson. Laura. Thank you, Linda. All right. Many of you have probably heard the quote by Benjamin Franklin, failing to plan is planning to fail. The 30 minutes prior to your speech contest are no doubt going to be busy. And I want to share some preparation tips that will help you have a more successful contest. It starts with having a waiting room, and you may be asking yourself, why is that so important? It allows your team to continue asking or responding to any last minute questions, technology checks, confirming all judges are named, et cetera, before the contest opens. I'd recommend having someone assigned to post messages and chat to those who are in the waiting room, welcoming them to your speech contest and letting them know when they will be admitted to the main room. Overall, it just avoids the congestion and confusion that we can see going on on the picture to the right. Next, it's important to allow your chief judge or designee time to review the speaker and judge's eligibility forms prior to the contest. To avoid a last minute rush to review, it's best practice to request that those forms are returned a few days, if not a week prior to the contest. It can put the chief judge in an awkward position to have to notify someone they're ineligible to compete minutes before a contest, and that will not allow them the time to adequately explain to the person what made them ineligible. As we had mentioned in the elephant in the room portion, sometimes people don't know what they don't know. They don't know what it means to be a club in good standing, et cetera. And it's best practice to have those forms, as I said, no later than your contest practice so that you create a positive experience for both the chief judge and the contestants. We know that it takes a lot of volunteers to put on a successful speech contest, and I know how much each of you appreciate those volunteers. With that being said, it's important to ensure that you have a walkthrough of your contest, which, will be, which Linda covered in her presentation. You wanna make sure that the contestants, judges, timers, ballot counters, sergeant at arms, and all other participants know exactly what their role is and what is expected of them. For instance, do I go to a breakout room? If so, when do I go? Even the most seasoned contest participant should attend your walkthrough to make sure that you have a smooth contest. Breakout rooms are an important tool of a contest. We use them for briefings, to sequester speech contestants as they wait until their time to speak, for our chief judges and the ballot counters to tabulate the results of the contest, not having appropriately named breakout rooms or knowing who is to be moved where and when can result in a delay of your contest. The chief judge must communicate with the Zoom master to inform them that all ballots have been received and the ballot counters and chief judge are ready to be moved to the breakout room. Practice moving people to breakout rooms and then having them return to the main room during your practice will help ensure you have fluidity in your contest. For our Toastmasters Online Speech Contest Best Practices, judges and ballot counters should remain anonymous. You may choose to have them rename themselves as Judge 1, Judge 2, etc., or have them choose another name. It is imperative that the Chief Judge and Zoom Master know who each judge is, 
how they're named so that they can quickly identify them and move them to a breakout room as needed. For example, if you have a protest on originality, your judges are required to go to a breakout room so that they can hear the contestants' explanation of why they think their content is original. Also, please have them remove their picture and replace it with a generic image. I can share you a gotcha of when I was a judge. I had renamed myself appropriately. I did have my picture on. Somebody asked a question that I quickly responded to, which made me easily identifiable. Whoops, don't get caught doing that. As with any Toastmasters event, you want your logistics manager to have a mic sniper who can mute people to eliminate any background noise during your event. During the opening of your event, we, your SASA should remind people to mute themselves and to turn off their videos when moving around to avoid distractions to the speakers and the audience. And let's face it, whether we're having a speech contest in person or online, we have to be prepared for Mr. Murphy, who says what can go wrong will go wrong, to pay a visit to our event. Having an experienced Zoom master will be your best friend during your online speech contest. Even I know my limits, and if asked to be a Toastmaster, I will politely decline. You must always anticipate technology issues and have an experienced Toastmaster who can help you hide and eliminate some of those issues. Next, I will turn this over to Trina Mackey to talk about audience admittance through the introduction of the contest chair. Trina. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, fellow Toastmasters. My apologies for being off camera due to a technical error. But let's talk about admitting your audience prior to the start of your contest. So waiting room got you us to review to make sure that our contest does not look like the picture to the right. Starting late. One of the most important skills that we develop through Toastmasters is time management. It is important to set the right tone for your contest by starting on time. A great way to set the right tone for your contest and dodge waiting room gotchas is to be prepared to open up the waiting room to your audience five to 10 minutes before the start of your contest. A really big gotcha is not having an organized opening as you admit the audience into the contest. Sharing the wrong information and having a sloppy contest program are gotchas that can be hard to overcome before your contest even starts. As you admit your audience into the contest, make sure that their microphones and videos are off upon entering. Avoid any frantic last minute prep by having a calm greeting about the contest and what the audience can expect as your audience is admitted into the waiting room. Next, please. These are some examples of how you can offer a warm meeting to your audience as they are admitted. You can display a PowerPoint with the contest rules, and you can also display a minimal program information with soft background music playing in the background. This sets the right tone for your contest and gives your audience the opportunity to review some rules, and maybe some housekeeping items before your contest actually starts. Please, Toastmasters, do not let the gotchas get you and your contest. Next. I will now turn control over to Toastmaster Debbie Thompson. Thank you, Trina. <clears throat> Let's let the games begin. So I wanna talk about the contest starts. This is the official contest. We're gonna talk about some of those gotchas that can be very painful. When we're talking about contest master, 
the Zoom team, and a few miscellaneous things. Next, one of the gotchas in a contest is not introducing the con contestants correctly. Next. So the rule book still tells us very specifically what we are supposed to do when we introduce our contestants. For the international contest, which is coming up, you introduce them by saying name, speech title, repeating speech title, and saying their name again. Next. This is written very clearly in the rule book. We're not making this up. So we do suggest that anytime you're having any contact, uh, different contest type, that you consult the rule book to see how to introduce them. Next. Another gotcha is not knowing who your contestants are. You don't know their speaking order. You're not really familiar with their speech titles. And one thing that I've seen before is you're not exactly sure how to pronounce the contestants' names. Next, the rule book tells us very clearly that during the contestants' briefing, we verify the pronunciation of their names and we understand that we have the correct speech title. That's something you can practice in your contestant briefing. The other thing is that's generally where you draw for speaking positions. So that would be when you would make note of that. Next, another gotcha. Talking too much during the contest or making content comments about the speaker or speech. Again, this is where, and Joanne mentioned this, this is where we have to remember, this is not a club meeting. This is not a, a normal club meeting. This is a contest. There are very specific rules that we need to follow. And remember as a contest master, you're not really there to entertain the audience. Your main purpose is to make sure you have a fair, and legal contest. And so we wanna make sure we do that. Next, the rule book tells us that we can open with a brief introduction. You may wanna say things to get people really excited. You may tell a joke, brief introduction, but once the official contest starts, you wanna make sure that you do not say any preliminary remarks about any speaker. And you don't wanna say anything when they finish about their, their speech. You don't wanna say that was excellent or that was a great speech, thank you. This is a contest. You don't wanna say anything that might influence the judges. Next. So again, we don't make any preliminary or ending comments about the contest contestant. You have to bring your poker face. Next, informing the audience too little or too much. <clears throat> next. So the rule book does tell us, next, there, there are certain things that we need to inform the audience about. I've listed those here and this is in the rule book. So these are the only things the rule book tells you, you really do need to let the audience know. <clears throat> Don't feel like you have to have a briefing for the audience. You've already briefed the contestants, you brief the judges. You don't need to tell them a lot about the contest. Just let them sit back and enjoy it. You've already briefed the people that really need to know everything they need to know. Next. Another gotcha is the judges still <clears throat> completing their ballots when the contest master starts the interviews. And this may not be something that is, is very evident, but uh, next, we wanna make sure that the judges don't hear anything that might in, influence them or they're trying very hard to avoid biases. So if, <clears throat> for example, you start the interviews and the judges haven't finished, they may, may hear things about a contestant that influenced them. They may hear, how long have you been a Toastmaster? What club are you part of? What is your distinction? <clears throat> and so you don't want the judges to be influenced by anything like that. Next, one of the recommendations and something that we've seen that is that makes the contest run a lot smoother is to actually move the judges into the breakout room with the chief judge and the ballot counters when they go to complete their ballots. This does two things for you. One, 
it gets the judges out of the room so that the contest master can continue with the interviews and you don't have to wait and wait and wait. And then the second thing it does, it helps the chief judge have all the judges in the room so that they can make sure you don't have any technical problems with the judge judges sending in their ballots to the chief judge. You can make sure you have everything you need and then the judges can move back into the, the main room. Next. One thing that's a, a contest gotcha is the table topic is presented differently to contestants. And it may not seem like it's a big difference, but if you're ad-libbing the question, you may ask it in such a way that it, it makes them answer differently. Next. So you'll see that the contest rule book says, next, all contestants must receive the same topic, exactly the same topic. So if you need to write it down so that you ask it exactly the same way to every contestant, then I would uh, encourage you to do that. Next, another gotcha. The contestants aren't asked to see the timer or pin the timer and not ask if they're ready. This is something I've seen in, in contests that are very effective. In, especially in a hybrid or a Zoom uh, online meeting, because it's, it helps you <clears throat> to make sure that you can hear them, you can see them, and by allowing them to, time to pin the timer or make sure they can see the timer, then you won't have issues later on in the con contest. Next. So the best practice rule book actually tells you to make sure that you can test the the AV before, check the AV before they speak, and it just makes for a much smoother contest. So take that time to ask them if they can, to ask them to pin the timer, make sure they can see the timer, and then tell us when you are ready. That way you can test everything that you need to. Next. Another gotcha. Talking during the moments of silence not asking for one minute between the contestants or asking judges if they need more time after the last contestant or putting two minutes on the clock after the last contestant. So the rule book is very clear about the rules around the contest and the silence. Next. It specifically says there will be one minute of silence between all of the contestants. So that is very clear. And I think we do a really good job there. However, I did have a, contest, a, a person who was being the contest master for the very first time. She thought during the moment of silence, she had to entertain the audience. So she was telling jokes and doing other things. As chief judge, I had to go up and tell her, no, the moment of silence is called the moment of silence for a reason. <laughs> we don't talk during that time. Next, something that is very definitely written in the rule book, and I think a lot of people mistake this because the rule did change many, many, many years ago. Next, but it does say that the contest chair will ask for silence when the last contestant finishes speaking. It doesn't say two minutes, it doesn't say five minutes, it doesn't say one. It says, after the last contestant, the contest chair will ask for silence until the ballot counters have collected all of the ballots. Next, another gotcha. The audience keeps their audio and video on, next. So this tells us in the best practice rule book that our audience needs to have their webcams turned off and their microphones muted during the contest and during the moment of silence. And so this is very important. Next. And that's written here. Make sure they turn off their microphones and videos. Next. One of the things they point out is that having videos on, especially if you have a large number of people in your contest, that it can interfere with internet bandwidth. So a lot of times we don't realize that may be the, the issue, but that's why we ask the audience themselves to turn their videos off. Next. <clears throat> One of the things that the Zoom team needs to understand is how to move people into breakout rooms. I think we already mentioned this several times. Next, 
but this just tells us that they need to understand the breakout rooms for table topics and evaluation contests because they're sequestered there. They need to understand how to move the chief judge and ballot counters in for voting. And in case of a protest, they need to understand who to move and how to move them in smoothly. Next. <clears throat> the judge has the video off, but the profile photo is, is showing. I saw this in a contest, so it didn't really make the judges anonym anonymous. I could tell who they were by their picture. Next. So we can see that all of our voting judges are supposed to be anonymous via the contest rule book. Next. But it says in the best practice rule book that our judges need to be off the entire time and that they can rename themselves judge one, judge two, judge three, something that shows they are judge, but it doesn't tell us their identity. Next. You can, <clears throat> you can Google to help you find out how to, find, how to hide your profile during a contest if you need to. Okay, another gotcha is not spotlighting the contestant during the contest. Next. It tells us clearly, next, that spotlighting the contestant allows us to control what the audience sees and to make sure they can see the contestant. So that's something that's very important. Next, timer, <clears throat> as we'll lead into this, because a lot of times if we, if we spotlight the contestant, it's also nice to spotlight the timer. Next but we don't want the timer because they are spotlighted and in view of everyone, we don't want the timer to be distracting. And so next, what we, what we is more effective is to have the timer show their background and instead of having uh, see their face and their reactions and their distractions. Next, the practice best practice rule book says you may wanna have the timer get outside of the view, or they can cover their camera with a piece of tape or piece of paper. Next. The next thing is comments by anyone about the contestants made in chat during the contest. Next. The best practice rule book has some recommendations about how to use chat. And you have to think about when you're using chat in an online contest. It's like somebody getting up on stage with a microphone and saying something because a little red light comes on. We see there's a, a chat message and it can be very distracting, number one, for the contestants and the judges. So we want to make sure that we either tell our audience or disable chat during the contest so that we don't have chat contests uh, distracting everyone. The other thing is somebody may something say something that influences, that can be seen as influencing the judges. You don't want to have somebody come on from your club. You're so excited. Yes, but this is a contest. Remember, it's not a meeting, a regular meeting. We don't want to say things like, that was a great speech or excellent job, so-and-so. This is a contest. We don't want any remarks made like that. So it's always good. Next to make sure that you don't use emojis, you don't use uh, the reaction buttons. Next. And you make sure that people are not using chat during the speeches or the moments of silence. Next. This is the final thing, but I think it's very important for online and hybrid meetings is the got you is not having a plan for technical difficulties, not thinking about technical difficulties. So if we have communicate, we need to have some kind of communication method that we can make sure our contestants know about. It may be phone numbers. It may be a way to get in. It's a way to get in touch with each other if there are issues. Next. And one thing I will recommend is the best practice rule book has a whole section on technical difficulties and things that you should think about that may go wrong. It just gives you an idea to think about planning them. You can't think of everything, but this may help you to look at certain situations and see how to deal with them. So I am going to uh, to put the best practice manual in chat for you. It's the 22-2023 version. Thank you. Next. 
Now I'd like to introduce Joanne as she talks about the contestant interviews. Thank you, Debbie. Gotcha. And we realized that after the contest. Next slide, please. Debbie has already talked about not spotlighting contestants during the interview. As she mentioned, you want the audience to easily see the contestant as they're speaking. Asking inappropriate or lame questions is another gotcha. It is recommended that the contest master prepare the interview questions before the contest. Use the information on the contestant's profile to develop meaningful questions. The contest chair, contest master talking too much. As Debbie mentioned, you don't want to influence the judges by making comments such as great job or so-and-so, that was an excellent speech. I really liked that. You don't want to influence your judges. Also, this is an opportune time for the contest master to employ his or her active listening skills. You want the audience to know the contestants, therefore allow the contestants to speak. Not giving each contestant equal time. All of the contestants are important. Treat each contestant as if that's the only person in the room and you want to give them equal time to respond, the next person equal time, the next person. So just remember, always do what you think is right and fair. That makes for a good cont a contest. Contest master looking at phone too much to determine if time to end the interviews. That's another gotcha. This could be distracting. It might also be perceived that the contest master is not interested in what the contestant is saying. Contestants should have your undivided attention. So it's suggested that if you are interviewing the contestants as a group, finish the round of questions, then look at your messages on your phone. And I know we want to be sure that we're in time and all, but we also don't want to be distracting. The last one is not thinking of how to end the interviews. I go back to what we said earlier, prepare, prepare, prepare. Prepare your comments in advance. Keep them simple and clear. You might also plan to fill time while waiting on the information on who, are the, who the winners are by playing music or taking a 10 minute stretch break or presenting slides with announcements of upcoming events. Whichever you choose, make sure that it is in good taste and that you do it well. Finally, prepare, prepare, prepare. So these gotcha situations will not come back to get you. Our next presenter, I turn over to Toastmaster JD Dirk Schneider, who will talk about determining winners, JD. Thank you so much, Joanne. Collect the ballots, count the ballots, and deliver the results to the contest chair. Easy peasy, right? So why does this part of the contest so often go wrong? Please check the chat box. Debbie's posting the forms needed to tabulate and announce the winners. Check them out and listen up to learn what to do with them. It's as easy as one, two, three, four, five, six. There are five easy steps to determining the winners and an extra step just in case the announcement goes sideways. Next. First is the collection of the necessary documents. The chief judge collects the time record sheets and the ballot of the tie-breaking judge. The ballot counters collect the ballots from the voting judges. When I'm chief judging an online contest, I have the entire judicial team, the timers, all the judges plus the ballot counters, adjourned to the ballot room after the final contestant. While the judges complete their ballots, I make sure the timers have texted me their forms and then I dismiss them to return to the contest room. The voting judges text their ballot to the ballot counters and to me, and the tie-breaking judge texts her ballot only to me. 
as their ballots are received, I dismiss the judges to go back to the contest room. Next. Now the actual ballot count begins and we'll follow the map of the yellow brick road that is printed right there on the counter tally sheet. The contestants names are entered in the contestants row at the very top. The judges names go in the left column. Next. Then as chief judge, I instruct the counters to draw a line down through the column of any contestant that's been disqualified and to draw a line across through the row of any judge whose ballot is invalid. Missing the judge's signature, invalid. Missing the judge's printed name, invalid. More than one name on a line, the same name on multiple lines, or the ballot is illegible. Invalid. Can I go back to the judge to have him correct his ballot? Nope. A ballot cannot be retrovalidated. Now that the counters are left with only the qualified contestants and the valid ballots, we keep following that yellow brick road of easy to follow instructions and mark the tally sheet accordingly. Each first place vote counts as three points. Each second place vote counts as two points, and each third place vote counts as one point. The counters add up the numbers in each column. If all tally sheets agree, the rule book tells us to recount them just to make sure. If the counters disagree, we recount until all counters reach the same result. Next. So what if there's a tie? Then and only then does the chief judge open the tie-breaking judge's ballot. According to the rule book, quote, the tied contestant who received the highest ranking on the tie-breaking judge's ballot will gain the contested place and any other tied contestants will be ranked in order behind that contestant, end quote. If like millions of other humans, that instruction is a bit murky, never fear. The District 14 Contest Training Channel on YouTube has a six minute breaking ballot room ties video explaining exactly how to break two way ties, three way ties, et cetera, for first place or any other place. It even comes with pictures in living color. Folks, learn how to properly break ties. Don't allow the wrong contestant to advance to the next level just because you couldn't take six minutes out to learn how to do this. And by the way, don't listen to anyone who says that since each contest requires an odd number of judges, there will never be a tie, so you don't need a tie-breaking judge. That's just not true. Next. When all counters are in one accord, the chief judge fills out the results form and delivers it to the contest chair. It shows the winners in the order in which they are to be announced, third place, second place, and ta-da, first place. Please don't confuse this results form with the notification of winners form, which ranks all eligible contestants, not just the top three, and which goes to the chief judge of the next level. These are different forms for different people for different uses. Okay, my friend, that's how winners are determined. But wait, there's more. Next. It is rare that the contest chair calls out the wrong winners for the wrong places or calls the name of a contestant who's been disqualified but it does happen. And when it does, there are three people who can interrupt the contest to correct the announcement. The timer who will realize if any of the names is of a time disqualified contestant and the chief judge and ballot counters who would know if the names were not read in the correct order. If you're one of these folks and you know the announcement is incorrect, it's your duty to speak up. To put the best spin on this awkward situation, my favorite line is, Mr. Contest Chair, 
please stop the contest to attend an immediate judicial review. And let's hope the contest chair and the chief judge have discussed this possibility before the contest so neither becomes that deer in the headlights we've all heard about. When the contest chair is straightened out, he can resume the contest with another great piece of spin. Ladies and gentlemen, there has been a misreading of the winners. The contest results are dot, dot, and dot, exclamation point. My job here is done, and now it's back to distinguished Toastmaster Linda Rogers. Thank you, Toastmaster Dirk Schneider. And our final part, announcing the winners, ending the contest, debriefing, and doing the follow-up. When you announce winners, make sure you announce them in the correct order. Not first, second, third place, but third place, second place, first place. And also make sure that you mention if there were any time disqualifications or not. The correct thing to do when you are announcing winners is to say there were no time disqualifications, or if there were, there were time disqualifications. And then our third place winner is, our second place winner is, our first place winner is. You want to make sure you do not make extraneous comments when you are announcing the winners. Do not say, it was really close in the ballot room. We had, our contestants were just off by a couple of points, but we've now decided on the winners. Do not say anything like that. Just announce the winners. And make sure that you have communicated with whomever is your Zoom master for spotlighting the winners to make sure that that person has the correct names in the correct order so that the correct person can be spotlighted. Then when we talk about ending the event, make sure you give careful thought to how you are actually going to end your event and what you are going to say. Just don't wing it. Also, do not thank all who filled a role by name. Remember, the judges need to be unknown to the contestants. So if you are wrapping up the contest and saying, I want to thank everyone who helped today, so-and-so were judges, so-and-so were ballot counters, that's not what you do. What I like to do is simply say, Toastmaster rules prevent me from mentioning many people by name. So just let me give a huge thank you to all who made today's event possible. And finally, when you are ending the contest, do not say, let's have a group picture. Everyone turn your cameras on because your judges can't do that or should not be doing that again so the contestants do not know who they are. One of the things that you need to do after your contest is done and your audience has left your main room is to have a debriefing. Don't wait a half a week to have it get everybody back together. Get them in the moment while everything is still fresh on their mind. Get some feedback from everyone about how the event went, things that went well, things that were gotchas, things that went sideways in spite of all of your preparation, but you still were able to recover from and your audience did not know what happened. One of the things you would want to do is also, or not want to do, is have the contestants and your judges at the same briefing. One thing that I like to do is to have the contest master and the contestants put into a breakout room afterwards so they can take pictures to remember the event. The contest master then debriefs the contestants, and when that is done, the contestants leave the meeting entirely. The contest master goes back into the main room and shares any of the debriefing comments with the rest of the group. And finally, for your follow-up, you're going to have the usual follow-up of sending thank you emails and certificates and things like that. But as JD mentioned, you also need to send the notification of contest winners on to the next level. So make sure that every eligible winner is listed on that form before you destroy the counter's tally sheet. You'll know who the first, second, and third place winners are. But if your contest had six contestants and no one was disqualified, do you know who the fourth, fifth, and sixth person was without looking at the counter's tally sheet? 
So make sure that notification of contest winners form is filled out right away. It is now time for us to talk about contest resources. Toastmaster Thompson will lead us through that. Debbie? Yes, Linda, thank you. Next slide. So we do have resources for you. We wanted to point out some of the things that we have used to put the videos together and the webinars, but things that you will need to review as part of your contest. So on the very left, you see the contest rule book. It is very important that you use the most current rule book because Toastmasters International does make changes every year and things change. So make sure you're up to date with the latest. The things that are changed do have a diamond beside them, so they're easy to identify. Go through and at least make sure you see the changes, but read through the rule book to make sure you understand some of the other things. The second thing on this resource sheet is the forms themselves. A lot of times the forms will tell you how to fill them out. The forms will tell you things about ethic, code of ethics, other things that you need to know. So uh, you may want to make sure that you uh, read the forms as well. The timers form, for example, tells all of the timing, things like that. So make sure you're using those forms and make sure you're using the most current forms because they do get revised occasionally. The next thing that people may not think about as a resource, but can be very, very helpful is the speech contest frequently asked questions on the Toastmaster International website. A lot of times it may answer some of the questions that you have, questions that you ask about contest and it can explain them very clearly. The last thing, and I did put this into the chat for you, is the online and hybrid speech contest best practices. This is the what I call the online hybrid rule book. It gives you a lot of considerations for having online and hybrid meetings, how to deal with a lot of these things when we come to Zoom or your platform. Uh, it has a section on technical difficulties and how to handle some of those things, what things to think about. So I do strongly suggest if you're having an online or hybrid meeting that you do review this manual as well. Next. So we also have our training videos, and we just wanted to make sure that you understand how we put them together and what our strategy was. We wanted to make sure, for example, that you have a video on the entire contest and how to have a fabulous contest. So you can listen to that one, and it will give you a very powerful overview. But we also wanted to make sure that for every one of the major roles, we have a webinar that shows them how to do that role and some of the legal things they need to do around that role. So for example, if you're contest master or contest chair, there is a webinar for you to listen to. If you want to, if you are going to be a contestant, we would recommend that there is a, a about a 12 minute video that you can watch to tell you things about being a contestant. However, also think about listening to the law abiding judge video that will tell you exactly what the judges are looking for in a contest. So if you're a contestant, I would recommend that you at least view those two so that you're learning how the rules around being a contestant, what may disqualify you, and listen to the video about the judges and what they're looking for in the criteria. The other thing, Chief Judge is a, an incredibly important role. So we have a video that will show you how to be an honorable Chief Judge and have a legal contest. We have one that's specific to online contest. So that is something you can watch to make sure that you are considering things for the online contest. And then because we understand a lot of people don't really understand how to do, how to break a tie, we have a specific video for that. As JD said, it's about six minutes. It's worth looking at because it really does explain exactly how to break a tie. 
And so these session recordings for Q&A are also out there if you want to listen to today's recording again, or if you want to go back and listen to any of the recordings that we have about the Q&A session. So we recommend that you do go listen to the webinars that will help you in your particular role or to conduct a contest. Next. Okay, so I will take over question and answers. I did see that we had a question in the chat from Matthew. And Matthew was asking us to, I'm sorry, if the district contest was going to be in person or if they were going to pre-record that session. And the way, because in the past we've had people pre-record their speeches, it was done ahead of time. They will not be doing that. Uh, Debbie or um, Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, but they will have the contestants in a room. They won't be on the stage, but the contest master, master will be on the stage to conduct the contest. That is true, Laura, in the sense that it will be a hybrid contest. So some contestants will be at the event in person. Some will be online. I'm not exactly sure how all the details work out for who is where, when, but we will have people in both places for the district hybrid conference in April. Now the contest, the speech contest, our speeches will be recorded in order to send them to send the winner to the next level, but that's during the contest. It's not pre-recorded. Will there be an audience when the speakers who are speaking in the contest, when they are presenting their speeches, will there be an audience or will they be speaking to a camera? My understanding is that there will be an audience. If it's all run like Toastmasters International did their hybrid uh, convention in August of this year, then there will be the people who are candidates, back up, the people who are contestants who are there in person will be in front of a live audience. The people who are online will be online, but being able to see that live audience to some degree at, based on camera angles, et cetera. We haven't worked through all the details yet for the District 14 conference, but that's my understanding at this point in time. Excellent. Thank you. What other questions do we have? And Laura, hey, this is Jerry. Yes. Uh, just one thing, being a Zoom master, one thing I learned over the years uh, for the contestants while they're doing their presentation to avoid uh, anybody inside the house using the microwave around them because they will mm -hmm. interrupt the contestants' video and um, audio. Thank you for sharing. That's great. So again, do not have anyone using a microwave by contestant because you may disrupt their signal. Thank you, Jerry. Save that hot pocket for later, right? After they're through speaking. <laughs> any other questions or any other tips that anyone's picked up since they've conducted their speech contest? Rodney, so. always check your link, your Zoom link, just just to make sure it's working. Cause we had an issue with that with our contest. It almost derailed everything, but we were able to pull it off. Nobody knew about it, but it it could have been really bad if we weren't able to get that link done in time. But we were able to, so I always do that. Thank you for sharing, Rodney. And that just goes back to, I know what several of us talked about, having experienced technical people help you will make sure that people don't see things that are going on. So thank you. Lorraine. At what point during the contest is the contestant notified that they have been disqualified? 
if they're notified. So teams, so the question was, when will a contestant be notified that they were disqualified? I can take that. It's up to the chief judge on time disqualifications, whether or not she wants to notify the contestant that there's been a time disqualification. It's up to the contest chair to notify the other contestants if they have been disqualified due to originality or eligibility or uh, referencing another contestant speech. Thank you, JD. And Lorraine, did that answer your question? Pretty much, but I still, so maybe no. At what point then does the contestant Oh, or is it, or the contestant does not have a way of letting you know that this is my original work or I did not quote from another contestant. So, so what's going to happen in that? Oh, sorry, go JD uh, or Debbie. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I was just going to say, it really depends on the type of disqualification too. You can be disqualified if you're a contestant and you are late you miss the briefing, you're late and the contest starts. So that would be something they would probably tell you, you've missed the time. If you are disqualified because of time, as JD said, that's something they would tell you, you know, your time. Uh, and But if you, there is a protest process. If you are disqualified because of originality or using someone else, uh, referring to someone else during the speech, then that is a protest that we're, we talked several times about the being able to put them into a breakout room because there's a very confidential discussion that goes on. All the voting judges are there, the chief judge is there, and they discuss the protest, what has been protested. Then the contestant in question gets an opportunity to come in and give their uh give their responses to the protest. So they are asked, you know, was this original? This is how we heard you refer to someone else. So that discussion takes place. Then the contestant leaves and the judges vote. At that point, that vote is final and they would need to notify the contestant whether they the judges voted for them to be disqualified or whether they voted for them to keep going. So it's, it would be after the protest process that we've talked about that they would know uh, that they were disqualified. But that is done after that whole process is completed. And the, the contestant does have an opportunity to give their, give their information. Does that? Sorry. Right, what other questions? or comments. I think just one thing I'd like to say is we have, have kind of touched the tip of the iceberg here. We haven't told you everything that can be a gotcha. You've got to use your experience. You've got to read the rule book. We can we say that you listen to the videos to really help you out because we've we've only kind of spotlighted some of the things that we've seen and some of the things we feel like are important, but that's not all of it. So please do use the resources we talked about and get people that are experienced to help you and practice, practice, practice. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Again, remember Debbie dropped a lot of excellent resources into the chat. So please go ahead and download those. I know that when I was involved in speech contests and Linda was our division director, one of those is her checklist is just to be prepared. You think they always say the devil is in the details. It's those small things that might trip you up. Please use those resources. They are meant to help you. Oh, 
All right, Linda, I am hearing no further questions. Thank you, Toastmaster Olson. Let's move on and go to our last poll, Toastmaster Olson. Absolutely, in just one minute. And I apologize, I just lost connection. So I still have my audio with someone else. This, these are one of our technical difficulties because someone else launched the poll because I'm getting back into those Zoom. I will do that. The poll is Thank now you. launched. And for the purpose of our recording, I will read the poll. Now that you have attended today's training, do you think you could organize and run a speech contest without gotchas? Yes, absolutely. Maybe, but I still have questions. Or no, I am absolutely out of my depth. Help. I think we have had everyone who is still here answer. So let's go ahead and end the poll and share our results. Three out of four people said yes, absolutely. And one person said maybe, but I still have questions. Thank you, Toastmaster Laura Olson for doing the polls. And now let's go ahead and end today's event. We want your help in spreading the word about our contest trainings. And if you know the tune, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. We have come up with new words. If you're happy with this training, tell your friends. If you're happy with this training, tell your friends. If you're happy with this training, then you'll want to share the news. If you're happy with this training, tell your friends. District 14 is large in terms of surface area, but we also have 130 some odd clubs with members. So share the news with your Toastmaster friends. Tell them about the training that we have on the YouTube channel. Encourage them to come to these monthly Q&As. Spread the word. Thank you so much for coming to today's event, our speech contest training on the importance of dodging contest gotchus. We will repeat this training on Wednesday of next week, starting at 6.30. This concludes our training today. Thank you for coming.